Guys, don't ever underestimate like what an awesome experience it is to get like, what is it, how many people are here? 200 something? 200 young people together in one room singing praise to God. Like, God must be overwhelmed by the glory and the praise that we're giving him when we do this together. And the people who may happen to listen to it, what an awesome thing. And how many of the older brothers and sisters in our ecclesias would just love to hear 200 young people singing a song like that. Fantastic thing to do. Okay, yesterday we talked about um, being pleased to meet Paul. Uh, Yeah, pleased to meet Paul, is that right? I think so. Yeah, it is. Pleased to meet Paul. Does anybody remember what were the three quotes that... I turned up and we all had a look at what were the three quotes, the progression of three quotes that Paul gives us that gives us an insight into how he saw himself. Does anyone know what those three three quotes are? Yes, where are you from? Wales. Wales. My aim at the end of this night is to have at least one score on everybody's country. Okay, everybody, that includes Canada. I know that's going to be hard, but no, no. (laughs) everybody... Ephesians 3, where are you from? Uh, UK. Nigeria. Nigeria. First <laughs> <laughs> Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, you're from Australia. Awesome. Okay, those are the three quotes. And can anybody tell me, what did the 1 Corinthians 1 say? Least, Least of what? Least of the apostles. Least of the apostles. <laughs> I don't need to ask where you're from, mate. <laughs> what did Ephesians 3 say? <laughs> no. Of who? Where are you from? Australia. And what did 1 Timothy 1 say? 1 for all of you. (laughs) No, 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 Scott said that. Okay. Right, well done. Okay, so 1 1 Corinthians 15, he's the least of all the apostles. Five years later, I am less, I am the least of all the saints. And then five years later, I am the greatest of all sinners. That was the little journey that the Apostle Paul went on over a 15-year period of his life. The older he got, the more he realised how great a sinner he was and how dependent he was on the grace and the mercy of God. Okay, tonight we are going on tour with the Apostle Paul. And I'm sure you guys have seen it over here. You know, like you see the advertising, you see bands coming in, personalities, actors, actresses, whatever they are. They fly in and it all seems so absolutely fantastic, doesn't it? It seems so glamorous. Flying around the world, like on their private jet, they arrive, you know, they strut their stuff on the stage. They hobnob with the rich and the famous. They're overnight at the the Savoy. That's your hotel there, isn't it? The, The big one, yeah. Now, overnight at the Savoy, they've got this big puffy pillow, huge bed. You know, it seems absolutely glamorous when you've got your own personal butler, gourmet meals, drive around in a limousine, sip champagne as you get transferred to your private jet, all the while waving at adoring fans. Just want signatures and souvenirs. You get on your private jet and you're off to the next city. I mean, could it get any better? I remember like when I was a bit younger thinking wouldn't it be awesome just to be like one of their assistants? Wouldn't it just be like awesome to travel around the world as one of their assistants just to like get a little bit of a taste of what it would have been like? Well, um, we're going to experience what it was like being on tour with the Apostle Paul and we're just going to get a small sampling of what it was like to tour with him and, and just see how good it was or how um, good it wasn't. Now let's just get into Paul's mind for a moment. It's been 11 years since he'd been told by his Lord that he was going to be touring the world sharing the gospel. And that whole 11 years, he's been sitting in Tarsus, his hometown. Does anyone know where where Tarsus is? What country is that in? That was was the United States guy again. Yes. (laughs) It is. Tarsus is in, is in southern Turkey, actually, southeastern Turkey. And Paul was spent 11 years there just waiting, waiting and waiting, hanging for the day that the Lord would actually carry out his promise to send him to preach the gospel. And you know, he didn't send his resume to Barnabas and say, mate, I'm qualified. I'm really good at this. Jesus told me I'm the one. I'm a good speaker. 
I should be out there. Come on. He spent 11 years just waiting. He didn't send any messengers telling them that he was good, that he was the one to do the job. He wasn't out there promoting himself. He wasn't keen to get onto the world stage. And then all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door and he finds himself in Acts chapter 11 in Antioch. Now just come to Acts chapter 13. He's introduced to the record in Acts chapter 11, um, being in Antioch, but it's Acts chapter 13 where we really start seeing what was going on and the impact that the Apostle Paul was having. And in Acts chapter 13, we get a pretty good picture of what life was like in the Ecclesia. The Ecclesia was growing rapidly. Lives were being transformed. Families were being united. People simply couldn't keep up with the work. Every Sunday morning, it was like one loaf, and then the next week, two loaves, and then the next week, three loaves. More chairs. We need more chairs. We need more, what do you guys call it? Goblets? Wine glasses? What do you call it? It was really scary, really scary sitting at the back of the hall over there on Sunday. You know, like in Australia, we had individual ones. Sitting at the back, they're thinking, oh no, everyone's going to have had one. And by the time it gets there, what's going to be left? It wasn't quite like that. But that's what it would have been like for this ecclesia. Just more chairs, more loaves of bread, more wine glasses, more people every single Sunday morning. What did they have in terms of leaders? Well, have a look at Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Now, there were in the ecclesia that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. There he is, and Saul. Okay, Saul was there. So they had the dream team. They had five choice preachers, and they were united. They were all heading heading in the same direction. The growth in this ecclesia was absolutely incredible, and then suddenly God just stepped in and everything changed. What happened? Who can tell me what happened in one sentence, five words? What happened? Yeah, and Barnabas. Where are you from, mate? England. Exactly. Have a look at what it says in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. As they ministered to who? To the ecclesia? No, just note that, right? It doesn't say that they ministered to the ecclesia. It says, as they ministered to the Lord, to Jesus, and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And they laid hands on them, they prayed, and then what happens? Well, they booked a ship to Cyprus. That was it. They were off. And by the way, it was no pleasure cruise, right? It was no Queen Mary too. This was no pleasure cruise trip at all. Now, what city is that? Who said that first? Yes. Of course it's Sydney. That is Sydney. Now, it's, he, he got on a boat. Like, Do any of you have pet rats? No, good. Because if you did, you wouldn't even put your pet rat on the boat that they travelled in. They were so dodgy. The boats were incredibly dodgy and he jumped on a boat like that and travelled. Does anyone know the distance from Antioch to Cyprus? Salamis was the city. Does anyone know? Approximately 100 kilometres, so about 60 miles, right? About 60 miles on a boat that you wouldn't even put your pet rat on. I have a question for you. How many times was the Apostle Paul shipwrecked? No. Twice. Who said twice? Unfortunately, you're wrong. (laughs) I haven't been handing out smarties, I'm sorry. How many times was Paul shipwrecked? No. Who said four? The answer is at least four, right? Because in 2 Corinthians 11, it says that three times he was shipwrecked. And then Acts chapter 27, you remember, on his way to Rome, he gets shipwrecked again. So at least four times the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. Um, At least four times. And who knows when that happened? Who knows when that happened, but once would be enough for me, right? I probably wouldn't be too interested getting back on a boat when I've been shipwrecked three times. Now you got back on it again, and maybe more. All we know of is that the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked four times. Now they arrive at Cyprus, right? And it's a um, fairly large island. Do you know they didn't just build a fire on the beach and wait for everybody to come? Wait for everybody to hear that they were there and then look, everybody will get word that we're here and when they come around our little fire, we'll be able to talk to them about the gospel. No, it doesn't say that at all. It says that they went through the whole island preaching. No trams, no trains, no island charter flights, no segways. No, they had two legs from the hips to the ground and when they moved them, they walked around. 
And that's what they did. The whole way through their country, they preached the gospel from one end to the other. And when they got to the other end, they got onto another canoe and cruised across to Perga. And do you know what happened at Perga? What happened at Perga? Sorry? No? Yes, who said that? Uh, Wales. Wales, do you want a packet of Smarties? <laughs> exactly. One third of this preaching team, right, just went missing in action. One third of the preaching team just said, sorry, I'm going home. I'm out of here. Packed his bags and took off. Now, just imagine you're on tour, right? Just imagine you're on tour and your key assistant, your key assistant, your manager, just hands in his resignation effectively, effective immediately and says, I'm going home. Imagine the, what that would have been like. If I was Paul, if I was Paul, I would have been tempted to write my resignation notice to the Ecclesia at Antioch, put it in the mail and say, I'm sorry, John Mark, one of yours, pulled out on me too hard. Find somebody else. Not Paul. Not Paul, not Barnabas at all. They didn't do that. But check out what was coming. Just have a look at what was coming. Fast forward to Acts chapter 14. They find themselves in a city called Iconium. Acts chapter 40 and verse 1. And it says that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and spake and a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Okay, then verse 8 tells us that they, after preaching the gospel there, they went to another city called Lystra. And they found there a certain man who was impotent in his feet and he'd been a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. And what did they do? They healed him. They healed this man. And then all of a sudden, the people start honouring them. The people start revering them. The people start saying, verse 11, they lifted up their voices saying, the gods are come down from us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. And you know what? The people who knew nothing about it, the people were, who were in entire ignorance, the last people to understand what was going on, to understand that they were being worshipped, was the apostles themselves. The last people. A language, right? They're all speaking a different language. Kind of like me coming here. We speak the Queen's English in Australia. We come and hear you guys. You sound like Americans. And it's just so hard for us to understand what you're saying sometimes. No, not really. I'm joking. But the apostles were in ignorance. They didn't understand what was going on and what was being said. But what a tempting moment, right? What a tempting moment. What an awesome opportunity for the Apostle Paul and for Barnabas to start getting a big head. You know, when the message is powerful, when the delivery is good, you can make the mistake of getting treated like a god. People start wanting signatures. They start wanting souvenirs. And it's pretty easy to let it go to your head and start expecting such adoration. Not Paul and Barnabas, right? Because the record tells us that quite to the contrary, they're ripping their clothes off. They're just ripping their clothes off. No, I don't want this. No, no, no. This is not at all what I want. They didn't want to embrace for a moment the adulation of the crowd. You know, guys, deflect all attention from yourself. Deflect it. That's exactly what they did. They just tried to deflect all attention from themselves. All of it. Just check out verse 19, how short-lived was this perceived popularity. The opposite extreme was just moments away, right? They're being honoured as gods. The people thought gods had come down from heaven. Now have a look at verse 19. The opposite extreme is just minutes away. Can someone read verse 19? Thank you. Now who's going to do it? Go for it. Welcome to the world of human praise. One minute people are bowing down to you, honouring you as gods. Next minute they're throwing tomatoes, or worse still, stones. And that's exactly what's going on here. Paul's trying to dodge stones, but he'd just been honoured as a god. It sort of reveals the instability and the uselessness of mere popularity. It's a perilous cliff with very, very jagged edges. Now here's a question for the Welsh. Other people will know it as well. Australia has a prime minister or had a prime minister 
of Welsh origin. Do you know who it was? I said the Welsh. <laughs> yes, you were right. Julia Gillard. She's actually of Welsh origin. Now, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll give the, I'll, I'll, I won't put up there the next time Wales get one. Julia Gillard was our Prime Minister, right? And in the last couple of months, she, was, she had sandwiches thrown at her twice. She's our Prime Minister. And young kids and people were throwing sandwiches at her. Vegemite sandwiches. Welcome to the world. <laughs> Vegemite is good gear. Welcome to the world of human praise. It's what it's like. Honoured one moment, stone the next, and that's exactly what's happening to the Apostle Paul and to Barnabas. And do you know what it says in verse 19? That they stoned him and then they dragged him. Just imagine that, right? Imagine that. Just imagine being hated so much that people start throwing rocks at you. And then, when you're unconscious... Instead of calling triple nine, they leave you for dead. No, they actually drag you out. Your skin gets ripped off. They thought he was dead. That's how lifeless his body was. He clearly didn't use his arms to protect himself. Does anybody want to volunteer for a demonstration of what that might have been like? No? It doesn't surprise me. No one would, right? No one would want to volunteer for what the Apostle Paul just went through here. But, you know, such was the suffering... Such was the trial and such was the pain that he went through to share the gospel which sheds so many blessings on us. So many blessings on us people who sometimes treat it with such little care and passion. Should I go today? Should I go to the meeting? Should I preach today? Heads I do, tails I do. That's what he went through to share the gospel. And you know, lying in a pool of blood, he gets up and he walks into the city. The same city that had just stoned him. He sleeps the night, no Dorchester, no puffy pillows. If you were stoned in Wolverhampton, the next day you'd be running the opposite direction, wouldn't you? Well, no, that's not the Apostle Paul. Not taking the fastest route in the other direction, not Paul... He pushed aside the stones, wiped the dust and blood from his face and climbed straight back onto the platform. That is authentic, raw passion for the gospel. Because the morning he woke up, he walked 40 miles to Derby. 40 miles to Derby with a splitting headache and none of them. Skin hanging off his back, bruised, Battered, open wounds, and he walks 80 kilometres, no limousine, no Segway. Successfully preaches to the people in Derby, makes disciples there, and then happens to return home via the same city that stoned him. Don't know what you would do, but I'd probably bypass that city. But no, he went back through that city, saw the brothers and sisters all the way back home. Now let's just get our... Whoopsie, where am I? No, that's right. Come back to Acts chapter 14. Or come, sorry, to the end of Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, they come back through um, the same ecclesias that they had just established and they arrive back at Antioch. And it says this, verse 26, And thence they sailed to Antioch from where they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the ecclesia together, they rehearsed everything that had gone on. You know, the ecclesia would have been really excited, right? These guys have been sent out to go and preach the gospel, who knows where, to countries they hadn't been to. And they head off there, and they come back at the ecclesia, and all the ecclesias together, it's Sunday morning, and they all know that Paul and Barnabas are going to be there. They're all excited to hear about the promotion of the gospel, how many ecclesias have been established, how many believers they've met, what has gone on, and it says, verse 27, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. I don't know about you, but for me, I'd probably be walking in there on crutches, putting all my arms in like a, what do they call those things, bandages, slings, you know, showing them all the bruises and scars that I've got. No, no, no. It says, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. Is that great or what? There was no big time interviews, right? No big-time big interview saying, mission accomplished. 
Let's have a press conference, shall we? And tell everybody how awesome it was. Tell everybody what we did, how great a job it was. No, no, no. They just reported how God had worked through them. Can somebody read for me 1 Corinthians 3 verse 7? Fantastic. Paul never forgot that. The person who plants is nothing. The person who sows is nothing. The person who waters is nothing. All the glory goes to God who gives the increase. And so when they came back, it was all about God. It wasn't about them. It wasn't about how they'd been bruised and beaten and stoned. No, no, it was none of that. It was all about God because all glory and all praise belongs to God. You know, the responsibility to share the gospel, the responsibility to preach the gospel is ours to embrace. But the credit is God's. All credit is God's for whatever happens when we preach. Whatever happens, doesn't matter how many people come to the lecture. You might have brought two people to the meeting. You might have brought ten people to the lecture. You didn't bring them. God did. He's the one who gives the increase. Don't take the glory for yourself. Get all the attention off yourself as fast as you can. Get out of the limelight. It's not your work. All glory belongs to our Father. And in all the trials and in all the successes of Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas, in everything they did, all of the glory went to God. All of it. Now fast forward to Acts chapter 16. Because in Acts chapter 16, we find the Apostle Paul back on the road again. And on this trip, he happens to pass again through the the same ecclesias that he established on his first trip. And he gets to Antioch, which is the furthest away from his hometown. And he's like, okay, let's go west. Let's go and preach the gospel further west, shall we? Let's try north, let's try west and see what happens. Well, it says Acts chapter 16 and verse 6. Can someone read verse 6, 7 and 8 for me? Yep, Acts 16. Fa- no, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so what's going on here, guys? They pass through Antioch. And they pray for open doors. Now, in the Bible, that's language for an open door is I go through the door. If you, it's actually a really interesting study. Go through the Bible and have a look at open doors and shut doors. Very interesting. But they pray for open doors, right? And ready hearts. But a revelation of some sort prevented them from going west into the territory that was to later become known as the seven ecclesias. You know, where um, all the seven ecclesias who are mentioned... Um, and they've just totally escaped me, Laodicea and, and all, the, all the rest of them, they were prevented from going there. Okay, well, we'll go somewhere else. And they started going there, and they were prevented from going there as well. You know, there's times in our life where we have a similar experience, isn't there? We step out in faith. We, um, we're going to do something. We don't know where it's going to take us. There's so much that's unknown. We make headway in our walk and then a door slams shut, just, just missing our nose. And we don't know where to go. We don't know where to turn. But just like Paul and Silas and Timothy, no reason is given sometimes. So how do we respond? Well, just like they did, they marched on. And it happened again. The same thing happened again. The Spirit didn't permit them. Eventually they passed by two country or two cities. They travelled west and hit this coastal city called Troas. And it was there that they received a revelation. You know, guys, that must have been seriously hard. Luke offers absolutely no insight into how these men responded to three dead ends. All we know is that they continued on and just kept going. But that must have been incredibly hard. Travelling miles and miles and miles for days only to get to your destination to find out that you're not needed or you're not wanted there. Do you guys do like pamphleting? Yeah, you do? You call it pamphleting? 
Yep. Okay, I just want you to imagine for a moment, right, that you're out pamphleting. And it is a typical English summer day. So there's blue sky in the morning, and then just as you start pamphleting, a storm comes, just like we've had today. No, no, just imagine that you're out pamphleting, right? And you come to this street, and you've got a couple of houses at the beginning, and it's a really big, long cul-de-sac. And you look down the end of the cul-de-sac, and right at the very end of the cul-de-sac, there is one lone house. And I bet some of you are thinking, I wouldn't do it. And those thoughts would go through our mind. Can I really be bothered walking to the end of the street? And yes, you muster up the courage and you muster up the strength and say, yes, I'll do it. And you walk all the way down to this end of the cul-de-sac. And when you get there, no junk mail. And what do you do? Sorry? Post it through anyway, okay? That, that might be the case. But I know what it would have happened to me. All these adjectives would come into my mind. I was like, pamphleting is such a waste of time. Like, it is such a waste of time. I've got better things to do than this. Pamphleting is so outdated. Let's do it something, let's do it differently. Let's use social media. Like, this is ridiculous. I've walked 500 metres down the road and I've got no junk mail. Why am I wasting my time doing this? All because one letterbox was closed. These guys had three. And they just kept going. Instead of turning back to Antioch, they just continued on and on and on and walked into the seaside city of Troas. And if you were to read 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, it would say that they received an open door. Where they came across an open door. Now what sort of travel distance are we talking there? You know, about 600 miles. 600 miles, right? No planes, no buses, no trains. No, just their two legs from their hips to the ground. And Acts chapter 16 tells us that in, in Troas, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. You know, notice that the record doesn't say that the vision appeared to Silas. Or to Timothy. No, no, it says it just appeared to Paul. And it was imploring Paul to come over the water. And this light goes on in Paul's head. Ah, I get it now. This is all about taking the gospel into Europe. This is all about taking the gospel further. This is about wider outreach. This is taking the gospel to places it's never been before. Now just imagine, right? Imagine you're on tour with the Apostle Paul. You're in your bed. It's the middle of the night. Paul's in a bed somewhere near you, you're asleep, and Paul comes and wakes you up and says, hey, I've just received a vision, we've got to go over to Europe, we've got to go over to Philippi. I don't know what you'd be like, but I'd be tempted, Paul, back to sleep, get a little bit more sleep, mate, I hope you don't have any more bad dreams. (laughs) Not they, not they, right? Look what it says, it says they packed their bags, no waiting for any more information, they didn't wrestle with the details, no waiting for the right time, no waiting for the right weather, no weak excuses like I get seasick or oh, this is too far from home, or I don't have the funds, or I'll miss my mummy. No sooner had God said go, and it says they left immediately. They left immediately. Now let's just get our bearings, right? Okay, this is where they started. Antioch over here, which is, oh sorry, right here, which is Antioch, north Lebanon today, right? From here, they headed up to, well there's Konya, which is Iconium, Antioch was about here. So they walked from here all the way through Derby, uh, Lystra, Iconium and Antioch. And then from there, Bithynia is up here, Mycenae is around here. They walk all the way over to Troas and they receive a vision that says, actually, we want you to come all the way over the water, over to here, to a place called Philippi. And that's exactly what they did. They jumped on a boat and they took off and they landed in Philippi. And on arrival, what did they find? What did they find on their arrival? I'm I'm going to put a slide up on the platform, up on the platform, up on the screen. And I want you to read Acts chapter 16 and verse 13 to to yourself and tell me what was the difference between the image that's on the screen and what Acts 16 and verse 13 says.
if you're wondering, yes, that's me. Many years ago. No. Sorry? Excellent. You see, guys, they arrived at the river and they found all the women having a prayer meeting, just sitting down around the river. You know, Silas didn't whip out the lectern and then call Paul forward to give an exhort. No. They sat down and shared the gospel one-on-one. Do you know the platform is not the best place? The platform is not the most effective place. The best work is done sitting down with people, taking the time to talk one-on-one. Small groups, sharing the gospel, talking to the heart, taking the time to do so with individuals. And that's what they did. And do you know what? Verse 15, who would have thought that that lone house at the end of the cul-de-sac would have resulted in a baptism? Not just of, the, uh, of Lydia, but verse 15. Who can read verse 15 for me? Lydia and her household. Lydia and her whole house were baptised because Paul pamphleted that one lone house at the end of the cul-de-sac. Now, we know the story of Acts chapter 16, or I assume you do. Let's just run through it in brief. Paul and Silas and Timothy healed a woman who was being mistreated by some slaves. And they find themselves where? Being beaten, right? They find themselves being beaten. Verse 23 tells us, or verse 22, the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded that they were to be beaten. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the prisoner to keep them safely. By law, how many stripes could a Jew administer? Sorry? 39. That is exactly correct. The Jews could administer 40 stripes, save one. Who's administering it here? Romans, right? Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll find Paul says that he received stripes above measure, which is more than 40, right? Above measure, numerous times. Maybe one of those times was here, right? Maybe one of those times. At least 40 stripes. I have a question for you. Why didn't Paul take out his Roman driver's licence and wave his Roman citizenship and say, you can't do this to me, big fella? Why didn't he do that? No. Sorry? No. It's... This is, we don't know the exact answer to it, right? So, I, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. I'm about to give you the answer. You didn't give me the opportunity to. This is what I think is the answer. Anyway, I don't think Paul could have brought it out. I don't think he could have done it to himself. How could I bring out my wild card? How could I waive my Roman driver's license and say, you can't do this to me when I've done the same thing to believers? So he didn't. He never pulled out. His driver's license. But it shouldn't have happened to him. He could have, and it wouldn't have happened. But he refused to do so. And you know, after that unenviable treatment, they were thrown deep inside a Roman dungeon with feet inside stocks. No Grand Hyatt, no, the, neither was it the Wandsworth, no, not at all. Their feet were fast in stocks, something like that. You know, I don't know exactly what they were like, to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter. But regardless of what type they were, they lay there on plush, thick carpet. No. They lay there with their backs, open wounds, bleeding welts. They lay on cold ground after severe lashings. How great suffering is that? You know, I wonder if they ever thought when they were lying there, is this what God had in mind when that man appeared to us and said, I want you to come over and help us? Is this what God had in mind? Well, yes, it is. This is exactly what God had in mind. It's all part of the plan. 
were on tour with Paul. Is this really where God wanted us to be? Yes, it is. Just picture the scene, right? There they are, inside a prison, bleeding. Welts all over them, wounds untreated, clothing not replaced, no shower, no toilet, no telephone to call a lawyer. Such was life inside a Roman prison in which Paul spent about 35% of his life as a preacher. That's what it was like. And just a few hundred metres away was the luxury of Lydia's home that he'd stayed in the night before. And what did he do when he was in prison? Hey Silas, sing me a song. Sing me Everybody Hurts. No. No. Look at what it says that they did in prison. It says in verse 25, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Do you know, prayer and praise in a prison isn't all that common. Songs of joy are not typically heard from men lying in prison in the situation and in the circumstances that they were, particularly with bleeding welts and open wounds. No. Prayer and praise isn't common in prison, full stop. But do you know what it actually says here? It says at the end of verse 25, the prisoners heard them. Now, of all the times that the word heard is used in the New Testament, the word that's used here is used once only. And it means to listen with pleasure. Of all the times the word heard is used in the New Testament, heaps of times, right? It's used once only to mean to listen with pleasure. And it's here in Acts chapter 16. And there's Paul and Silas singing praises and worshipping God. And all the other prisoners are listening and hearing it with pleasure. And then all of a sudden, all the doors are flung open, all impediments to movement. Their escape is made possible. All the bolts and the doors are gone. They can just run on out of the prison. And Paul Paul and Silas calls out, no, 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 no. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere at all. And verse 30, the jailer comes in. He springs in. He comes trembling before Paul and Silas. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I don't know about you, right? But verse 31 says, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and and thy house. If that were me in that jail right, right then... I'd be suggesting that we get out of the jail pretty quickly because we've just had an earthquake and the whole thing could cave in. But I'm thankful that Paul wasn't like me because they sat there in that prison and they shared the gospel. And then what happens? Well, it says that verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptised. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, the last time it happened to me, water on open wounds tends to be a relatively painful experience, yeah? It can be a pretty painful experience. And again, I don't know about you, but if I was Paul, I think I would be able to justify using the miraculous powers that God had given me to heal these wounds. Hey, Silas, let's do this, do this healing thing on each other, shall we? You heal me and I heal you. No. Do you know, it never happened. They could have justified it by saying, hey, look, this would provide fantastic evidence to the jailer and to his family that that we've got the gospel, that this is true, that this is right. But no, not once, not once, even though they had the spirit gifts, even though they had the ability to heal people, not once did they exercise it for themselves. Isn't that amazing? Not once did they use it to heal their own sufferings. They used it to restore the health of others, not themselves. And so after receiving stripes above measure, spending a night in a jail, lying on your back, as you had to do when you're in those stocks, they finally get out of jail and Acts chapter 17 tells us that they're on the road again. Straight on the road again, 150 kilometres 90 miles to Thessalonica. You have got to be joking. You've just been beaten within an inch of your life and he's straight back on the road, 150 kilometre trek. He just did not stop. That's what it was like 
being on tour with the Apostle Paul. He arrives in Acts chapter 17. He shares the gospel with people in Thessalonica and then leaves there and he arrives at another ecclesia or at another city in verse 11 at Berea. He finds that they're more noble. Another ecclesia is founded. But Luke keeps us riveted to reality because um, they didn't like him in Thessalonica and they didn't like him in Berea either. And the reaction in verse 14 was fairly prompt and decisive. They had to get out of there. And they got out of there pretty quickly. But it would prove to be another advance in the gospel cause. Because not only does Paul leave this city with a newly planted ecclesia, with a great culture, but his escape takes him to another city. The progress was like wildfire. Stamp it out in one location and it just flames up in another. And that's exactly what it was like being on tour with Paul. You know, being on tour with Paul was one pretty high-risk experience. His whole life, in fact, was characterised by taking risks, by acts of faith. Really? Was he a risk-taker? Was Paul really a risk-taker? I mean, did he do anything or say anything controversial? Did he say anything that was different to what people had always heard, to what people had always believed and like passionately clung on to? And held on to? Well, imagine being the first person to come out and say in public to people who'd prided themselves on circumcision, to people who had used it as a symbol of being clean and unclean, to people who had used it of, well, you're either God's people or you're the scum of the earth, you're an uncircumcised Philistine. Imagine coming out and saying to those people that circumcision has no benefit. Imagine coming out and saying to them that circumcision availeth nothing. Whoa. Whoa. Just imagine what that would have been like to come out and say that for the first time. And you know, Paul didn't just say it once. Every single city he went to, he had the same message for the Jews. Circumcision availeth nothing. It means absolutely nothing. There is no value, there is no need for circumcision for salvation. Just imagine standing up on a platform in a Christadelphian ecclesia for the first time propounding a teaching that is completely contrary to anything that was ever said from the same platform. Imagine saying, for example, that Israel are not God's people. Wow. Wow. Wouldn't dream of it, would we? Wouldn't dream of it for a moment. But um, Paul did. He stood up there and he said what needed to be said. He was right. He had the Bible behind him. But imagine the pressure. Imagine the sweat running down his face, his heart beating every time he stood up in front of a new Jewish audience and said, hey, circumcision is worthless. It means absolutely nothing. He wasn't concerned that people would sideline him. He wasn't concerned what people would think of him. He wanted to be accurate to the text. He wanted to be accurate to God. And yes, he would have been roundly criticised for it. Sure, he was judged because of it. But you know, he took the risk that faithfulness to God was of more value than the loyalty of men. He stepped out in faith with God on his side. Now just fast forward to Acts chapter 18 and verse 23. We find ourselves at the end of another of Paul's trips. This time, around 15,000 frequent fly points. That's what he would have accomplished. Now let's just get this in our head for a moment, right? It's AD 54. He's just spent three years on the road, literally. Literally. Literally on the road, walking. No car, no limousine, no bus or aeroplane. He's probably got 50 candles on his birthday cake. And the last 15 candles are nailed and battered with cuts all over them. And I mean all over them. In fact, Paul tells us what those candles had experienced. Just sit back and let me read for you what those last 15 candles had experienced. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. In stripes, or in labours more abundant, 
in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been floating in the deep, in journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, fasting often, in cold and nakedness. A not so inviting travel brochure of a Christian preacher's life. You know, he might have celebrated his 50th birthday in prison or maybe clinging to a piece of driftwood. And while most 50-year-olds are thinking about jacking up their pension fund, thinking about retirement, maybe a three-month holiday, you know, Paul's folding his shirts. He's packing his pants and he's put his shoes in his bag for another four years on the road. You know, I honestly couldn't think of anything worse than living out of a suitcase for four years. Spending four years on the road with no place called home. I love my shower. Like my shower. Not the kids, my shower. I love like my house, my bed, my desk. Not somebody else's. Even the best hotels, even the Savoy, it's not mine. I can go and get the best room there. But it's not my room, it's not my house. He didn't have any of that. He got bashed, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked, he was robbed, wherever he went. There was no NHS, there was no Royal Antioch Hospital, no disability or welfare payments, and if there was, he would have been legible for both. The average temperature was about 35 to 45 degrees, hot, humid and sweaty. No ice packs, no freezer packs. Just try to imagine life in the sandals of Paul without air conditioning. Just try and imagine that. Travelling was downright dangerous. Johannesburg is known for carjackings, right? Where Paul travelled was well known for highway robbers and murders. The man was addicted. There is no other word for it. Would you go on tour with him? Would you throw throw in your career, your job, your security for a few years on tour with Paul? Would you take that risk? You know, I've asked myself sometimes whether I would do that. Because it's questions like those that force us to probe deep below the surface of our incredibly comfortable lives. Incredibly comfortable. But you know, guys, life is not about being happy, comfortable and pain-free. It's about becoming the men and the women that God wants us to be. Are you tempted to go on tour with Paul? Does all that sound inviting? You know, on top of all those things, he tells us that there was another thing that he had. Another burden and another pressure. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, on top of all those things, cometh upon me daily the care of all the ecclesias. He ached with anxiety for the ecclesias. Ached with anxiety for the brothers and sisters that he had shared the gospel with. You know, are you keen? That's what it's like on tour with Paul. Are you keen? Are you ready to go? Is that something you want to do? Who am I? Any guesses? No? No guesses at all. No. I'll give you a hint. He's an artist, or was an artist. Yes. Up the back. Did you put your hand up? No, sorry, I thought somebody put their hand up. Anybody? No? 
Sorry? I can't hear you. No. No. <laughs> that is Raphael. And Raphael was actually asked to paint the frescoes in the Vatican. And on one particular occasion, as he was painting these frescoes, a cardinal from the Catholic Church happened to walk past him and pointed out to Raphael and said, Hey, the face of the Apostle Paul, or the face of Saint Paul, appears to blush. And you know, without even turning, without even looking at the cardinal, Raphael said, he blushes to see into whose hands the church has fallen. Would he blush now? It's fallen into your hands. Would he blush now? Dear all, I hope this finds you in better shape than I am. We've just returned from three years on tour, about 15,000 frequent flyer points this trip. But it wasn't all that good for my physical health. I'm still recovering from the severe flu I caught and I'm hoping to finally get some decent treatment for the countless lashings I received in Philippi. My body is a diary of scars. But I'm in high spirits as the Father has achieved some incredible things. Actually, we need some assistance. Are you available to join us for a couple of months? Not sure where we'll be going or staying, but it will definitely involve some risks. The likelihood of two or three broken bones is pretty high. No need for travel insurance. The father takes good care of us. No pressure, but don't forget to wear some decent shoes and a few changes of clothes. Being on tour is not all peaches and cream. You keen? Let me know. Paul. P.S. I'd rather be sailing than sinking, but we may get shipwrecked as well. <laughs>